Hello and welcome. Bandits attack several communities in Zamfara state, killing three persons and abducting several others. Pandemonium as suspected thugs disrupt PDP Congress in Zamfara state. Governor Matawale and his deputy trade blame on who's responsible for the chaos. We begin our review of the year 2021 with focus on the economy. And UK Health Secretary Sajid Javid says there will be no new COVID rules in England before the end of the year. From our London studio. News tonight. Nigeria's stock market projected to close the final week of 2021 positive as investors position for dividend paying stocks ahead of full year financial results announcement by listed companies. On sports news tonight, the Premier League reveals a record 103 players and staff have tested positive for the coronavirus in the period from December the 20th to the 26th. And from Abuja, vendors count their losses from the inferno that gutted the next supermarket, cash and carry supermarket in Abuja on Sunday. Gunmen suspected to be armed bandits have invaded some communities under Gusau local government area of Zambara state, killing three persons and abducting an unspecified number of villagers, mostly women. An indigent of one of the affected communities who pleaded anonymity told Channel's television that the bandits who were on motorcycles were moving from village to village on Sunday, looting shops and houses looking for food items and also abducting women. Channel Television also gathered that the majority of the people in these villages have started leaving their communities to Gusau, the state capital, for safety. Confirming the incident, the Zamfara State Commissioner for Information, Ibrahim Dosara, however, told Channel Television that only Geba community was attacked on Sunday by bandits. Mr. Dosara says three persons were injured during the attack and that nobody was killed because of the quick intervention of the security agencies deployed to the area. Staying in Zamfara, this time political violence where there was chaos today in Gusau, the Zamfara state capital, as some suspected political thugs invaded the venue of the Zamfara state's People's Democratic Party State Congress. Although no life was lost, the thugs succeeded in destroying the voting materials as well as two vehicles belonging to party members before setting the canopies ablaze. The state governor, Bello Matawale, and his estranged deputy are, however, trading blame on who's responsible for the disruption. This location was intended to hold the state congress of the People's Democratic Party in Zamfara State, but for suspected political thugs who had other ideas, invading the venue and destroying everything in sight, chairs, canopies, and even vehicles. When I came in the morning, everything was okay. When I left, somebody just called me and told me that our place was destroyed. Was destroyed. I rushed and I saw what is going on here. This development did not, however, deter the PDP delegates from holding the exercise as they relocated to the Guzo Command Guest House. Reacting to the incident, the Deputy Governor Ali Uguzo accuses Governor Bill Matawale of fueling emotions, reigniting the matter of Governor Matawale's defection to the All Progressives Congress, APC. So I don't know how we're supposed to feel safe in this, in, in Guzo Metropolis, and if this is the kind of uh, security we can expect from the city of Guzo, I wonder what the people are experiencing in the rural areas. So I think this is a big issue that I think uh, His Excellency, I'm calling out to him to come and apologize or, dis or point out the people who are responsible for these atrocities. If not, we hold him um, complacent in, 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 this, in this act and it will not be taken. The newly elected state chairman of the party promises to carry all stakeholders of the PDP along to ensure unity, peace and a vibrant political party. Our focus is to build and galvanize the party to become a very strong opposition. Meanwhile,
The All Progressives Congress, APC, denies having any connection with the incident, insisting Governor Matawale has promised to maintain a conducive political environment in the state. His Excellency, first of all, is not even aware of what has happened. He's only being reported of what is going on. They should be able to go to the police and find out who perpetrated the problem for them. And uh, it is uncharitable for him as a sitting deputy governor to call on his boss to apologize for something that His Excellency is not even aware of. About 1,187 delegates participated in the Zamfara State Congress of the party, which was conducted in the presence of security agencies, representatives of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, and journalists. And as the nation continues to work on these challenges, the Odo State Governor Godwin Obaseke believes this period should be a time for sober reflection. He made the call during a PDP stakeholders meeting in Bini City, the Edo State capital. According to the governor, the present challenges in the country mirror the impact of the ruling class in the society. Nigeria is going to a new stage. There is a new paradigm. The politics we started in 1999 has now expired or is expiring. So anybody who is playing politics, the way it was played in 1999, cannot succeed. Because the children who were five, six years old in 1999, today are now getting married. They are now the ones that are going to be in charge. So if we don't provide leadership, they will push us aside. They are more than us. I have their data. They are not happy. They do not like what we did to them during answers. So we don't have to wait for them to express themselves again. Let us provide leadership. The son-in-law to Senator Rocha Sokoracha and a former governorship candidate in the 2019 governorship election in Imo State, Uche Mwosu, says he was not invited by the police before he was arrested. Mr. Mosu made the declaration after his release from police custody. A statement by his spokesman, Wadike Chikeze, says Mr. Mwosu did not spend the night in police custody as every effort was put in place to get him out. Mr. Mwosu was arrested by men of the Imo State Police Command in Eziyama Obire community, Nkwere local government area of Imo State, on Sunday, although no reason was given for his arrest. The year 2021 has been a mixed bag for many. In Nigeria, however, the economy recovered at a faster than expected pace since the pandemic-induced recession in 2020. To kick off our review of the year 2021, our business correspondent Chimeze Obi Iwago takes a look at the performance of the economy in the outgoing year. By the fourth or at worst, the first quarter of 2021, that the country will exit recession. That was the optimism with which policymakers entered year 2021 after 2020 that was described as a year like no other owing to COVID-19 pandemic. True to the minister's words, Nigeria exited the recession in the fourth quarter of 2020, earlier than expected. The economy grew by 0.51% year-on-year in the first quarter of 2021, slightly faster than a 0.11% rise in the prior period. 5.01% year-on-year in the second quarter, owing to base year effect, and 4.03% in the third quarter. I use the word the three T's. Uh, it was a tumultuous year, it was a turbulent year, it was a trying year. But in spite of these challenges, we're able to at least take out a modest growth. Aside from the fairly improved GDP, all other critical macroeconomic variables are not favorable. The PMI is still below the 50-point threshold. Unemployment rate is at a double digit. Inflation remains elevated at 15.4%, despite data showing it's trending lower. 
The price of the market is too cost. All water, even the pepper, come on pepper now. They are selling 1,000, 2,000. Even people that can buy small one, they can't be able to buy small one. Everything is there for government hands. Are you understand? Because I know that economic now they bring all this thing high. I will that economic is okay. Everything will come down. And the big elephant in the room remains the foreign exchange. Uh, we saw uh, serious levels of depreciation in the exchange rates, uh, which was very significant and had very serious impacts across all sectors of the economy. There were also concerns among investors in particular about the volatility of the exchange rates. Because in order to plan particularly long term, uh, you have to have a, a very stable you know, foreign exchange environment. We didn't quite have that. The IMF is projecting a growth rate of 2.6% for Nigeria's economy in 2021. The central bank sees a 3% growth rate, while the fiscal authority remains more optimistic with a 3.5% projected growth by the end of the year. While these projections are positive, COVID-19 still poses a risk coupled with the slow progress on revenue mobilization. It's very important to grow at higher rates. In our view, that we require much deeper reforms, uh, resolving the fiscal uh, situation, uh, bringing balance, uh, making sure that uh, uh, fiscal deficits are uh, lower. 2022 should be a year of specifics. Specifics. No mirage, no promises in the air. The year 2022 no doubt offers some flicker of light at the end of a very long dark tunnel. But that light can only shine brighter if the policymakers take the ball by the horn by making some decisive basic structural changes in the way the economy is presently run. And with the 2022 budget now passed by the National Assembly awaiting President's assent, Nigerians can only hope for the best. Chimeze Obiwago, Channels Television News. Well, let's get a bit more perspective. Our business correspondent, Chimeze Obiwago, joins us now. Chimeze, great to have you on this side <laughs> this time around. <laughs> Thanks, IJ. Yeah, we've seen the major things that you, that you pointed out there, but I mean, you followed this for the last one year. What were the major ups and downs for you following? All yeah. right, let's um, look at it. From, let's start with the positives, okay? Looking at where we're coming from in 2020, where we saw lockdown, massive lockdown restriction, Oil price, which of course is our major source of revenue, was heavily battered. And then coming into 2021, economy started opening up. We saw a lot of economic activities happening. In fact, for the year, oil price, this year we have seen oil price record at least $80 a barrel. And that is good news for the economy. It has helped to support government revenue. As such, we exited the recession. Again, there are other positive developments during the year. We saw the passage of the PIB and, of course, the signing of the PIB. And talking about uh, supporting the economy, I must give it to the central bank, which has actually played its role in terms of intervention. You know, they are in their uh, intervening, uh, intervening to the, uh, uh, on the economy. That also supported growth there. But then there are some issues. Inflation remains significantly high, even though uh, data from the National Bureau of Statistics is saying that inflation is trending high. But you and I know that when we get into the market, prices of goods uh, and services are really on the high side. Inflation has eroded uh, the purchasing power, people's purchasing power. Then there's also the issue of insecurity, which also is also helping to fuel inflation. Farmers couldn't get to their farms to produce. That again affected uh, the agri sector, which also is impacting inflation data, particularly uh, food inflation. And then the one that I described as the big elephant in the room, which is the foreign exchange. Mm -hmm. That foreign exchange market experienced a lot of volatility uh, this year. We saw the Naira heavily devalued, particularly at the parallel 
uh, market and more problematic was the issue of supply in the foreign exchange market businesses couldn't access um, FX easily as they should well the central bank tried its best to try and see how they can actually uh, support and bring up supply in the FX market that remains an issue and that has contributed again to the uh, inflation number that we so, are so seeing. So the average person um, watching and who has listened to you from January to this point, what sort of a year would you describe it economic-wise? And then what's the forecast, I'd say, even though you're going into 2022? Well, it's a mixed bag. Talking about this year, there's the ups and there's the down. But then going into 2022, it's quite promising, despite uh, COVID-19 that is ravaging the global economy with the Omicron uh, uh, variant. The truth of the matter is that we're not going to see the kind of lockdown that we saw uh, in 2020, and that's actually positive. I mean, government all over the world, people seem to have come to terms that this virus seem to have it will stay with us for a long time, and so they are beginning to find a way to live. Uh, with it. Again, there's also the crude oil market is also, the outlook is also uh, positive. That again will also support government revenue. But then the risk I see here is that 2022 is a year of election. There's going to be a lot of political activities mm -hmm. and there's this tendency that attention will be shifted from economic issues to politics. I think that's where the issue would lie. So, but mm -hmm. for us, all we can do, as I always say, keep our fingers crossed and uh, hope for the best. Indeed, we've heard that from you all year. Thanks a lot, Chimizu, our business correspondent. Thank Chimizu, you, IG. Obi Wabu. And in part two, after the break, more on the performance of the economy in 2021, as we're joined by a development economist, Professor Ken Ife, from our Abuja studio this time. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 on Channels Television, coming to you live from Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Bandits attack several communities in Zamfara State, killing three persons and abducting several others. Pandemonium as suspected thugs disrupt PDP Congress in Zamfara State. Governor Matawale and his deputy trade blame on who's responsible for the chaos. We begin our review of the year 2021 with focus on the economy. And UK Secretary of Health Sajid Javid says there will be no new COVID rules in England before the new year. Let's get some more insight into how the Nigerian economy fared in the year 2021. I'm now being joined from Abuja by a lead consultant, ECOWAS Commission, and a development economist, Professor Ken Ife. Thanks a lot for joining us on the News at 10. Well, thank you for having me. Now, we've seen some of the major highlights in the report there, but what would you say is the major factor that shaped the economy for you in the current year? Well, I, I like the report. It's very balanced. I have to say that we need to give a little more credit to the state actors that use quantitative fiscal and monetary policy response to get us quickly out of that recession. And then also you need to be aware that there are three major challenges, existential challenges, apart from the COVID, which is a matter of life and death. There is the asymmetric insecurity in the six geopolitical zones, attacking everything, scaring away investors, you know, shortage of food and all of that. Then you also have the, the discouraging figure on unemployment, which required the massive response. So all of these three were contained in 2021 because it was a year of recovery. And I know that in relation to our next plan, which is 2021 to 2025, this year being the first year of it, the first leg, there is a better plan to, to strengthen and grow the economy next year. And speaking of next year, I mean, we spoke to a number of analysts and one of them in particular says 2022 should be a year of specifics. Now, if you were to advise the economic team, for instance, on what we should begin with, what would it be? Well, the thing is, we need to look at the, the plan because the plan is a very, very aggressive and very, very ambitious plan without a doubt. But it is achievable to be hoping to raise 350 trillion Although government, all governments are going to be around 50, we're going to depend on the private sector to deliver 300 trillion and that. But it's not by wishful thinking. There are structures 
There are, I mean, one of them already you know, the infrastructure company, which is already going to market for 15 trillion. There are more trusts coming in on, on stream, more funds. So there are specific plans to actualize, quite unlike previous pre preceding uh, plans, which I have looked at. Strong monitoring framework. Um, you can see what targets you are working with for every sector has a matching order on what they have to bring. I remember speaking to the finance, uh, see, uh, the bank CEOs, telling them what section of their own plan and, 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 and how they reacted to that. So it's a, it's a better plan and there's better, more capacity for, for seeing, for, for delivering this plan. And, right. and, um, and I also think that some of the questions about um, the, the unemployment of 35 million we expect to be delivered by 2025, the poverty lift uh, of, of 50. I can see how possible it is that we could move in that direction. Um, and and that's, that's, that's how I feel reading through the document. All right, finally now, just quickly, to get your projections um, for next year, seeing as many have already said this is coming into an election year, um, what do you see in your crystal ball, if I can put it that way? No, the, the private sector is in the driving seat without a doubt with the figures I have told you. And they are rising to that challenge because I saw the banks wake up based, you know, led by the CBN governor. They are going for that, that target. Now, the thing about this is that I can't even see how the election is going to distort the delivery of the plan. If you look at the, elect, the, the, the finance, the projection, both the Finance Act that is, you know, tidying up the, the rough edges and the actual 2022 plan is planning to bring down the debt service under control, just around under 50%. And then you also saw an aggressive plan by not only government, but also Senate, you know, calling on all, all, all agencies to order and then aggressively pushing to widen the tax base and get more revenue from the operating surpluses. And uh, it's a zero tolerance. I, I go to these meetings in the hearings in the Senate. I go, I hear, I can feel the pause. Everybody's all hands are on deck. They want to raise the money because they, they, okay, you can see the PIA itself. Just the PIA, which has been a work in progress for over two decades. Uh, FIRA says we are more confident that we get about twice our revenue next year, over 10 trillion. So it's all coming together. But it's a very painful, painful exercise to go through. The debt is going to continue. We're going to be incurring more debt. It's all in the borrowing plan. But the fact is that because we are now addressing revenue and moving it from 7% right. to 15%, ambitious, many other institutions think, but I think we probably will go over 10%. Uh, right. IMF and, um. and others think that it may be around 8.8% or, you know, but, but I, I think we will achieve more in um, next year. And, right, bring down, and I'll tell you one other thing that's very important. Oh. The, the proportion of the oil revenue to government budget has dropped to near 43%. So that inflection tells you that non-oil sources are beginning to play up. And then the resilience in our economy is now being built by that, part, that single fact. And if you All look right, at the last GDP result, prof, yes. it is still the non-oil that is dragging and, and improving the growth. Yes, apologies, Prof. I'm going to have to thank you uh, for, for that insight as you've given us leader, consultant, ECOWAS Commission and development economist, Professor Kenny Fay. Thanks for sharing your thoughts with us on the News at 10 tonight. My pleasure. Still ahead on the news at 10, Nigeria's stock market projected to close the final week of trading positive as investors position for dividend paying stocks. And that will be on business. Do join us again. Welcome back to the news at 10. Let's cross over to Abuja. Here's Markwe Ogun Yusuf. Markwe. Hello, Ijeoma. It's good to see you. you well, here it's a day after the fire outbreak at the next cash and carry store in Abuja, and vendors have started assessing the level of damage caused by the inferno. Relevant government agencies have issued statements confirming that investigations into the cause of the incident have begun. Our correspondent, Kayla Megwa, reports. 
It is the morning after the fire at Next Cash and Carry Supermarket in Abuja. The gates are locked to the media and all non-staff on the instruction of the store's management. We try to get into the premises through the back gate. Though the fire has been contained, there is still smoke in the air. Job done, the firemen wrap up their equipment. If you don't want to go, can talk about it and then you'll be returned. Parts of the building that were barely standing the day before have collapsed. Speculations are that the entire edifice must be brought down and be rebuilt. Some of the vendors take stock of the items that were salvaged from the inferno. The FCT Police Command, through its public relations officer, Josephine Ade, released a statement reading in part, investigation is ongoing to ascertain the cause of the fire. So far, no casualty has been recorded. Same goes for the Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, Mr. Mohamed Bello, who in a statement signed by his Chief Press Secretary, Mr. Anthony Ogunle, says a thorough investigation will be conducted to ascertain the cause of the fire incident in an effort to prevent a recurrence in any other business establishment within the FCT. What is there, no? What answer? Too many for back there. Mm -hmm. What answer? Yeah? From Channel TV, won't you let us inside? There's still a strong smell of smoke in the air and there's still a lot of fires being put out. We've been told by the security right here next cash and carry that the press are not allowed within these gates today, hence the need to film from outside of the fence of this building. And we'll be watching to see what kind of progress is made in the days ahead. Kayla Megua, Channels Television News. And in Lagos, the household of God Church has joined the rest of the world to celebrate Christmas at a service in Lagos to commemorate the birth of Jesus Christ. During his message, the senior pastor, Reverend Chris Okotie, says the birth of Jesus signifies a new beginning for Nigeria. Our correspondent, Olu Phillips, reports. <laughs> The one celebration members of the faith-based community have subscribed to in commemoration of Jesus' birth. It's the Household of God's Church Christmas service from the opulent auditorium here in Lagos. When the chief chorister and lead pastor steps up, he starts this way. Happy birthday, dear Jesus. Happy birthday to you. Then to the Bible reading, which paves the way for his Christmas message. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you glad, good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Praise Jesus. Reverend Okote describes the significance of all the activities in that time leading on to the birth of Jesus Christ, including the decree by Augustus Caesar. When God was ready to bring Jesus, all the inhabitants, not the system, the men and the women and the children, no matter who you were, were commanded by a power to begin to move. When God is about to enter into your life, the right people will begin to occupy the right places. Everything will be juxtaposed with one another. Your father, your mother, your friends, your enemies, your state, your government, everything will move. A few more songs of thanks for what his best has brought to the world. There is a gyro start that the birth of Jesus rekindles on the inside of every preacher or every man and keeps us afloat in the tempestuous waters of political misadventure. And we know that Nigeria is at the cusp of a renaissance. 
the birth of Jesus portends good things for, for our nation. For the householders, God's sovereignty which prevailed then is still potent to do much more today. And that's all from our Buja Studios. It's over now to Anne Wawodo, who has how the markets are faring in this season. Thank you, Malpe. Let's begin business news tonight. With the final countdown to 2022, beginning the week at the local equities market, which is expected to get a rebound to a positive close for this year when it resumes from the Christmas holiday on Wednesday this week. And this is coming on expectations that local and foreign investors at the Nigerian exchange will be taking positions in stocks with attractive dividend yields ahead of the announcement of full year 2021 financial results by listed companies. But so far, Nigeria's stock market's performance this month remains negative at 2.3%, while its year-to-date performance is positive at around 4.9%. Stock markets are regarded as a vote of economic confidence around the world, and this can be described as one of the gauges for the country's economic growth. The board of Oando PLC has appointed Ron Keshokefu and Nana Fatima Mede as the independent non-executive directors with effect from December the 23rd. In a statement sent to the Nigerian Exchange Limited, the listed energy firm says that their appointments follows the resignation of the two directors of the company. Mrs. Shokefu currently serves as the chairman of the board of directors of the Nigerian Deposit Insurance Corporation since appointment in 2019, while the other person has an accountant who has served in several companies at different capacities. Profits at China's industrial firms grew at a much slower pace of 9% year-on-year to 805.9 billion yuan, and that's about $126.5 billion as at last month. Let's talk about the latest data released by the country's statistics bureau today. It shows that industrial firms' profits rose slower by 38.0 to 7.98 trillion yuan in 11 months this year. And that's against 42.2% rise, which was recorded in the first 10 months. The world's second largest economy, which has lost steam after a solid recovery from the pandemic last year, faces multiple challenges and deepening property downturn, persistent supply bottlenecks, and impact of strict COVID-19 curbs on consumer spending. And that's business news tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Mwaudo. The rest of the news at 10 continues now with Ijoma. Thanks a lot, Anne. Next on the news at 10, UK Health Secretary Sajid Javid says there'll be no new COVID rules in England before the new year. Plus more international news from our London studio. Please stay with us. Welcome back. The UK Health Secretary Sajid Javid has confirmed there will be no new COVID rules in England before the new year, but advise all to remain cautious and celebrate outside their homes on New Year's Eve if possible. This decision comes hours after the Prime Minister Boris Johnson was briefed by the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientist Advisor. Here's Simon Pusey with more in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Funeral plans have been released for the South African anti-apartheid leader Archbishop Desmond Tutu who died on Sunday, age 90. It is here where his ashes will also be interred. The Archbishop of Cape Town announced that a scaled down ceremony due to COVID restrictions would mean only 100 people could attend the service. Earlier, President Ramaphosa arrived at Desmond Tutu's residence to offer condolences to his widow, Leah, and other family members. Every evening, the Cape Town City Hall has been bathed in purple light to mark his passing. While bells of the town's St George's Cathedral will toll for 10 minutes each day at noon until Friday. People have left flowers outside the cathedral where he worked as a bishop. The funeral plans include two days of lying in state before an official state funeral on January the 1st. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his tireless campaigning against white minority rule in South Africa. 
His doctor said he died peacefully at a care center in Cape Town. More than 1,400 flights have been cancelled globally today due to COVID-19, capping off a miserable festive period for thousands of travellers. Chinese and U.S. destinations have been the worst hit. U.S. airlines say the disruption is due to crews testing positive or isolating. Hong Kong is banning all South Korea's Korean air flights for two weeks after positive cases among some arrivals. In all, more than 8,000 flights have been grounded over the Christmas period. The Taliban has said Afghan women seeking to travel long distances by road should be offered transport only if accompanied by a male relative. The directive is the latest curb on women's rights since the Islamist group seized power in August. The majority of secondary schools remain shut for girls, while most women have been banned from working. Campaign group Human Rights Watch said the new restriction moved further towards making women prisoners. Somalia's president says he has suspended the prime minister for suspected corruption. President Mohamed Abdullahi Mohamed has subsequently been accused of carrying out an indirect coup. Prime Minister Mohamed Hussein Robel was not immediately available for comment, but a government spokesman said the president's action was unconstitutional and that Robel would continue with his duties. The U.S. Embassy has urged de-escalation. The parents of 43 Mexican students who disappeared in 2014 have held a protest in Mexico City to demand justice and attend a mass in honor of their children. Joined by activists and other students, the parents marched to Our Lady of Guadalupe Basilica, urging President Andres Manuel López Obrado's government to tell them of the whereabouts of their children. Later, the group attended a special mass. The students from the Ayot Zinapa Rural Teachers College disappeared in 2014 in the state of Guerrero. Heavy snow has continued to pummel northern and western Japan a day after more than 100 domestic flights were grounded due to bad weather. Footage shows huge amounts of the white stuff in Niigata Prefecture in some places burying parked cars. Meter-long icicles were also spotted hanging from buildings. Japan's public broadcaster NHK reported that about 35 inches of snow is expected to fall in the mountainous area of Niigata by Tuesday morning. Australian fire crews have contained a bushfire in the Perth Hills in the west of the country after several structures were burnt down. Aerial footage showed burnt houses, sheds and vehicles. Police Commissioner Chris Dawson appealed for public information while the cause of the fire was being investigated by police. And finally, tech company OneWeb has launched 36 communication satellites into space from a cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. The company has been launching satellites into orbit as part of its plans to deliver global high-speed internet access. The Interfax news agency said the satellites, launched aboard a Soyuz 2-1B rocket, would be separated in stages. OneWeb is readying to take on Elon Musk's Starlink in the fast broadband form space segment. It will launch satellite broadband services in India by May 2022. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Thanks a lot, Simon. Let's take some sports. Here's Ayotunde Balibu. Many thanks in Joma. The English Premier League has revealed a record 103 players and staff tested positive for the coronavirus in the period from December the 20th to the 26th. Just a week ago, the English top flight set a new high since testing began in 2020 with 90 positive cases. That mark has now been beaten as the Omicron variant takes a toll. So far in December, 15 Premier League games have been called off, while the three divisions below the top tier have been decimated by postponements. Paris FC and Lyon have both been thrown out of the French Cup earlier today for the hooliganism that forced their December the 17th tie to be called off at half-time. The teams were all square at 1-1 in Paris when fans spilled onto the pitch at the Charlty Stadium following incidents in the stands. Rather than try to finish the game, the disciplinary commission of the French Football Federation decided to expel both teams. Days after the United States announced a diplomatic boycott of the 2022 Beijing Olympics, China said that it has received multiple visa applications from relevant U.S. officials, mainly from the State Department 
and Defense Department who aim to witness the Winter Games. The overturn of events was announced today with the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs saying that it will process the applications as per international practice, relevant regulations and principle of reciprocity. Earlier this month, the White House slapped fresh economic sanctions and visa bans on Chinese officials in the wake of alleged human rights violation. I'm Ayotun De Balogun. That's a wrap on Sports News. Thanks a lot, Ayo Tunde. And the main news again. Bandits have attacked several communities in Zamfara State, killing three persons and abducting several others. And also, the UK Health Secretary Sajid Javid today announced that there will be no new COVID rules in England before the end of the year. And that's the news at 10 tonight. Thank you so much for staying with us. I'm Ijo Mahunyato. Good night.